just a second. Well, I want to welcome everyone again. This is Rob Dalrymple. Uh, this is our fifth conversation and a series of live stream events as we discuss the crisis in Gaza and Israel and Gaza. Our goal, as I've said before, is to address the breadth of issues, the geopolitical, theological, historical, and give regular updates as to what's happening on the ground today. Our goal is to equip you with information that will help assist you to have meaningful conversations, to become advocates for peace. It's beyond the time for the church to sit around and kind of listen and figure out what's happening. We need to have meaningful conversations and get engaged in this. So we're going to bring on a variety of guests. We want to hear from both sides as if the conversation can be whittled down to two sides. But you know what I mean. You may not agree with everything you hear, but I can assure you that there's so much that you've not been told. And I think that what's going to happen is you're going to have this cognitive dissonance. You're not going to know what to do with what you're hearing. And I want to exhort you. It's okay. Listen. Live in the tension. That's why it's important that we follow all the live streams. Uh, so next Monday, I'm going to have at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time, we're going to have Jonathan Kutab, a Palestinian lawyer, come on and really give us some understand, incredible insights. On Tuesday, we have two Messianic believers, one of which is an Israeli citizen, Lisa Loden and Richard Harvey, to kind of give us an understanding from a Jewish perspective. Wednesday night of next week, we'll have Greg Khalil, an, a, a legal advisor to the Palestinian Authority, a, a lawyer, but an American citizen, as well-connected as anyone to this particular issue. Then on Thursday, we're gonna have a Christian Zionist, Michael Brown, a, a Jewish apologist who will be on uh, and we'll discuss. And then the following Tuesday, I'm gonna have Dr. David Crump on uh, to talk about kind of wrapping this all up. And uh, we've already had webinars on Tuesday with myself giving kind of a prophetic charge of last week, uh, May Cannon on Wednesday night of last week, uh, giving us insights and understanding as to what's going on in Israel, Gaza. Dr. Bruce Fisk was with us on Thursday, really giving us a historical understanding of what this, what's going on uh, in this particular crisis. Uh, and then yesterday we had Salim Anfus, uh, a Palestinian Christian, giving us an understanding of what's going on there. All the links that you can get are on the uh, Determined Truth homepage. So there's three ways you can find out about what's going on. Go to the DeterminedTruth.com uh, homepage. And there on the DeterminedTruth.com homepage, you will see a listing of all the webinars. And you typically the, the newest one, the current one is at the top, but you'll link, uh, scroll down You'll see the links there. And those links work for past as well as present and future uh, events. You can also subscribe to the Determined Truth YouTube page. And when you subscribe to that, you'll actually automatically be given email notifications. This is coming up tomorrow. This is coming up in one hour. And then the third way is to email me at rdalrymple19 uh, at gmail.com. I'll put you on the Determined Truth email list and you'll get regular updates as what we're doing at Determined Truth. Uh, and there. Now, I want to also encourage you to make comments, ask questions in the comment box. We'll do our best to wade through them and uh, uh, figure out which ones are, are good for, for Gary Burge, who's got our guest tonight. In fact, I'm pleased to announce and introduce to you a good friend of mine, Dr. Gary Burge. Gary uh, is a distinguished professor uh, uh, and scholar in biblical studies and, New Te and theology. He's got a PhD from, in New Testament from the University of Aberdeen. Uh, he's dedicated his career to teaching and writing on the subject of the Gospel of John, Jesus, and the Land. God, Gary's published numerous books and numerous articles. He works closely with the Christians in Palestine. Uh, one of the found, one of the leaders of Christ at the checkpoint, which we'll talk about uh, here when we're all done. So, Gary, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Rob. It's a privilege to uh, join you and your audience. Thank you. Uh, so, Gary. Um, Tell us more about Gary Bird. Just start with that. Just uh, who you are and kind of give us a background on, on Gary and your family, sure. whatever it might be. Yeah. So um, uh, throughout for my career, I have been a professor of New Testament uh, in a variety of places. Uh, most of my career was at Wheaton College in Chicago. And uh, about six years ago, I moved to uh, Calvin Seminary um, here in West Michigan, where eventually I ended up as dean. Um, but that isn't really the story that is relevant to what we're doing here. Um, I think God blessed me with a number of uh, just remarkable experiences uh, mm -hmm. during the course of my life. 
Um, way back when I was 20 years old, I was selected to be an exchange student. I ended up in Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, it was a great time, uh, 12 months in the Middle East, except the Lebanese Civil War started while I was there. Mm. And so we just went to countries all around the Middle East, uh, literally. We hitchhiked through Turkey, we traveled through Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, you name it. And I think the Middle East has a way of leaving this mark on you. Um, it's mm. a fascinating culture, and uh, the people are so warm and so friendly. Hospitality is a, a hallmark of that world. So um, when I came back, uh, I ended up going to seminary at Fuller Seminary, did a PhD in New Testament, but still the Middle East was a big part of my own heart. Mm. So when I started teaching, um, I began asking students, you know, hey, why don't we go to Israel, mm. Palestine, you know, and we'll see what's what. <laughs> so, what. What year was that, Gary? Oh, my goodness. It was probably in the late 80s. Yeah, it was in the late wow. 80s. Yeah, because the first uprising started once while I was over there. Wow. So, um, back, yeah, so I've been back. I've led so many trips to Israel for students. I can't even count them. It's got to be over 25 okay. somehow. But awesome. then also I became networked in the uh, sort of the linkages of friendships of pastors, um, mm. not only in Palestine, but in Jordan and in Syria, um, Lebanon. And, and that meant leading theological conferences. I've done that in Baghdad, in Beirut, um, been in interfaith dialogue groups in Libya, Egypt. I mean, it gets kind of crazy after a while. You're forgetting Livermore, California. Yes, that's the only place I've missed. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so all of this has just been a second track. So I'm a New Testament guy. I do New Testament studies and all that. You mentioned that. But then there's this other track that kind of is running along inside of my life, and it's in a very important track. And so no doubt Palestinian has Palestinians and the Palestinian world and the history of the Palestinians and their life there has really captured my heart uh, more than any, probably because I have so many friendships uh, mm -hmm. over there. So, uh, yeah, so when this present uh, crisis began, you can imagine um, uh, it was not only shocking to me, but it was uh, really upsetting to me because of the friends I've had over there. So I've been actually talking to people on the phone and um, just saying, are you safe? What are you doing? What's it like? Right. Um, so life in Gaza is catastrophic. Life in the West Bank is very dangerous now, right now for a Palestinian. And life inside of Israel is, uh, is also dangerous uh, for a Palestinian. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, this is uh, an amazing 26 days we've lived through. I think it's 26. Is that right, Rob? Mm. Uh, today's Saturday, so it'll be 27 or 28, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because so. yeah, it's an even number, yeah. Um, wow. Uh, is there anything in any of those stories, Gary, uh, Gary of people in the West and Gaza or, or whatever that you want to go ahead and reflect on right now? Yeah, as a, as I think that set the context. Well, well, we don't. There are a lot of things that I, when I have conversations uh, with people here or online or I've done quite a few interviews, actually, like this one. Um, the things that I, I, re I, I, I understand that people just don't know, don't understand is that First, Gaza is a really small place, um, mm. small, 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 small. <laughs> and um, it's only five miles by 25 miles, and it's densely populated. Um, Gaza mm. City is wall-to-wall -wall apartment buildings. So you, you just can't drop a bomb inside of a context like that. If you do, the mm. collateral damage is absolutely going to be massive. Okay. So people don't have some idea of scale. That's the first thing that I think I've learned over time is that this place is small and it has two over 2 million people, I think 2.2 .2 or something like that, yeah. a million people inside of this enclave. And so um, life inside of there is so deeply congested. Um, and then alongside of that, most of my friends don't realize that this community is incredibly poor. Um, mm. The second thing they don't realize is that this community has been under an embargo for 16 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, uh, the Israelis control everything about this area. They control how much water is in it. They control the electricity, the internet. They control um, fuel that goes in and food that goes in. They have to import right. quite a bit of food. And at one point, they were even counting how many calories do we really want to send into Gaza because we don't want, we want these people to feel 
their sort of dependency on us. So yeah. anyway, um, the desperation inside, uh, the Israelis have got thousands of people in Gaza that have been in prison for some time. So that's another factor there. The third thing, Rob, that I think my friends just don't realize is that Israel created Gaza. The Gaza that we all are talking about today, Israel created Gaza. Now, okay. let me, I know that's going to shock a couple of people, but let me just explain it to you and then you'll catch it right away. Okay. Um, in 1948, when Israel was created as a country, what they had is a demographic problem. There were far more Arabs living in the country than there were Jews. Clearly, it's just the British had this as a colony and a protectorate, and then they 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 did censuses, and so we know exactly what the populations were. Last census was in 1947. Anyway, um, and so therefore Israel went on a campaign to depopulate all of the Palestinian areas pushing them out of their villages, towns, destroying their houses, stealing their homes, pushing 700,000 people out. Can, just you, you just don't let that go flying by you. 700,000 people. It's amazing. Anyway, the area in the south, uh, like Beersheba, Ashdod, Ashkelon, um, these areas, Joppa, all the way up to Joppa by Tel Aviv, these were Palestinian towns. And so in 1948 and 49, these towns in the south were emptied and their populations were pushed into Gaza. So therefore, I have uh, friends um, who have um, who live in Gaza, but they know their ancestry goes back to the Tel Aviv Jaffa area. Um, but they lost everything because of this. So therefore, Israel pushed them into Gaza and then they shut the gate. And mm. they said, we don't want you coming back in. And so these people have been living in this pressure and squalor for an incredibly long time. Right. But it's not even that. There's one last step, Rob, and I'll go over to you and you can ask me something. Yeah, but that's fine. That's fine. The, the big revelation to me just most recently is that Israel was very involved in the creation of Hamas. That's going to blow your mind even further. Yeah, yeah. I, I've said that before. And it just sounds it's, like propaganda or whatever. I know, I, I know, I know. Yeah. And the Israelis yeah, yeah. don't want to talk about this. That. Yep, but in the right. 1980s, um, as the West Bank and Gaza were continuing to sort of organize themselves and grow in their own sense of self-identity, and the Palestinian Authority that now is based in Ramallah, they were really becoming the strongest political party, both in Gaza and in the West Bank. So anyway, there was this social movement group that was a bit more aggressive than the Palestinian Authority inside of Gaza, and the Israeli government was afraid of the growing power of the Palestinian Authority today that we think is moderate. Anyway, so they began funding Hamas. And so Hamas got on its feet, was fully funded um, during this time by the Israeli government to create a rival, sort of to divide and conquer, yep. as it were, inside of Gaza and the West Bank. So Hamas being the more radical group, um, but smaller and weaker, and then the Palestinian Authority, more moderate, but nevertheless fairly strong. So anyway, um, uh, Hamas grew and it grew and it became like the Gazan identity. And actually, once the horse was out of the barn, Israel couldn't get it back in the barn. So what happened was Israel became very anxious about this sort of more extreme ideology coming out of Hamas. But that was a reaction to the remarkable pressure that's inside of Gaza from population and poverty. So anyway, that is why in 2006, in an election that was overseen by um, Jimmy Carter's organization, a fair and free election, Hamas was elected to a majority inside of Gaza because the people of Gaza wanted anyone who was going to speak up for them in a very assertive way. Well, it wasn't long after the election that suddenly uh, Hamas then is taken over by its extremists and the rest mm -hmm. is history. So that today Hamas is a, is, is a really pretty radical group. But the, but most of us don't realize is that for the last 20 years, Hamas is the government of Gaza. It isn't as if Hamas is an army uh, Hamas has a military wing called Al-Qassam. They're the ones who did what happened on October 7. 
But if you are have a career in water management, sewage management, libraries, schools, <laughs> anything, your paycheck is coming from Hamas. That's the government. Mm. So therefore, when Israel says we are going to target anything Hamas, they are willing to target things Hamas has built, anything. So imagine, for instance, if you're someone who is in a high executive position overseeing sanitation in Gaza, you are a member of Hamas because that's the organizing body for the whole thing. You're now a target. Hmm. The whole thing is a little bit crazy making, but um, that's why there's a lot of a lot of confusion yeah. when it comes to the Israeli narrative, which is very much the same as the American narrative. The two are sharing the same narrative. But um, in, in most recent polling, well over half of the Gazans do not feel sympathetic toward Hamas at all. Right. So, so what we have today is not, it's dishonest, I think, to say Israel is at a war with Gaza. It's it, it, I mean, with Hamas. Um, actually, what Israel was trying to do right now is to depopulate Gaza. What they're doing is pushing the population all the way to the south, um, and those who happen. remain behind are probably going to be killed. This is a genocide. This is a siege and genocide going on. They will go to the south, and I think what's going to happen is that Israel is going to uh, create a crisis on the Egyptian border. And um, the world community is going to say, Egypt, open your gates as a humanitarian gesture, the flood goes into Egypt or Sinai, there's talk of that, and Israel is done with most of Gaza. But remember, these are people who have experienced dislocation in the 1940s, right. and now they're going through their second dislocation, but this time under a shower of bombs. Right, and let me add a couple of things to this, Gary, and you can comment if you wish that, uh, and I have a question in there also, and that is, uh, well, let me start with the question. Was Hamas at its initial founding, were they radical terrorists with an ideology of, of eliminating uh, Israel, or did that come shortly thereafter, after its foundation? No, you know at that? the very beginning, they were sort of a social movement that was very small, very, um, yep. um, shall we say, uh, non inconsequential. Oh, yeah, <laughs> but, right. But once the Israelis began to empower them, um, then really they became a platform for um, an aggressive stance toward Israel. But even there, Rob, I think this is, I, I, I continuously return this conversation. People say to me, but Hamas wants to destroy Israel. Um, that is the same as saying Vancouver wants to destroy Canada or San Diego County wants to destroy America. <laughs> I mean, the scale is so ridiculous. But Hamas cl uh, clarified in the revision of their own charter in 2017, they clarified, you know, our argument is about the nature of Israel. In other words, it is oh. a state based on race. And it is a state which excludes us, puts, puts us on the margin, and doesn't give us a future or an opportunity. We, Hamas is saying, want that sort of state to be destroyed. And therefore, from the rubble of all of that would be some other kind of configuration. The Israelis don't believe it. They believe they want to kill Jews. Um, the Palestinians are saying, well, no, really what we are against is our occupation. So an impression. anyway. Yeah. And, and bear in mind that the people that have been displaced for 75 years, I don't know if there's anybody in Gaza that's 75 years old. Yeah, which, which yeah. means everybody that's in Gaza ha has experienced in their family history nothing but this displacement. That's right. Um, and I've, and I, uh, okay, so now, so, so hang on, Rob. Again, one of the things that's fascinating is okay. that um, seventy to seventy-five percent of all of the people living in Gaza right now yeah. are from refugee exactly. lineage. From so forty-eight, all yeah. of them, seventy-five percent, can say, "My parents, my grandparents, they all remember their stories." Right, and in fact, here's the. This is not my home. My home is somewhere in Israel, where where people of Jewish descent are now Israelis are now occupying it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. In fact, Elon Pape spoke at Berkeley last week. Uh, and an he's a Jewish uh, Jewish scholar. I'm sorry, Elon Pape is a Jewish historian who was at Haifa right, University. Yeah. He did a lot of research on um, the um, ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians in Israel. So he's a Jew. He's Israeli. Yeah. 
and he lost his job okay. and therefore he now is at Exeter University in England. Um, anyway, his book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine is absolutely essential reading right now. Okay. Right. But Pape was saying that, you know, these, when al Qassam came out in, on October 7, these were all basically young men who had memories of having lost lands. And what they, when they went to these places, most of these villages, Israeli, Kibbutzim, all of these places, these towns, were sitting on top of many of the villages which um, had been emptied of Palestinians. And so it was like, Pape says, they were going actually to create a kind of revenge uh, action because of the losses of their grandparents. Wow, I never saw that one coming. And here right. you have this coming from a Jewish Israeli right. scholar in England. And you're like, wow, that's really provocative. That's amazing to yeah. think about. Yeah, and and and, and uh, let's be reminded of it. So we had um, uh, Dr. Bruce Fisk on. I know you, Gary, that you know uh, yeah. uh, Bruce uh, well. And he discussed a little bit of the historical context of Gaza yep. and uh, why they elected Hamas. Yesterday I had Salim Anfus on. And he discussed, you know, why I, I why would Palestinians like Tamaza? And he's like, we just want to change, right? Yeah. That was his yeah. answer there. Uh, and we're not saying that Hamas, therefore, is justified in their acts of violence mm -hmm. and their atrocities against the Israeli people. And what we're saying, again, we're talking about the governments and the leaders of these institutions, the leaders of Israel, the leaders of the United States. Gary and I both know, and Gary better than I, uh, people in Israel, people in Palestine, they want peace. And they can will, live together. That They want to live together. And they want peace, and so um, uh, let's understand that's the historical, that's the context. But but there's a backstory uh, there's to a backstory. what happened October seventh, and it didn't happen in a vacuum. And, and we're not justifying what happened October seventh. No, no, uh, no. And one last thought here, Gary, and, and, that, and, and you may have read it, but but you know, we're in a in a dialogue with a with a group of individuals, and I said, listen, I strongly believe in nonviolent resistance as a Christian. That Jesus would not have me respond in violence. That, that the way of Christ is the way of cross-bearing love, that we suffer violence for the sake of our enemies. We don't inflict violence. But if you came into my house and you did this to my wife and you did this to my children and my grandchildren or my, my uncles, I don't know how I would react. I hope by the power of God's spirit, by the power of his grace, I would love them. I would lay down my life, but I can't promise you that I'm strong enough to do that. Right. Um, and, and it doesn't justify what they've done, but we have to understand you know, 90 percent of Gazans live on before October 7th, they relied on foreign aid as a daily means of survival. Right. The food um, insecurity, so, we call it food insecurity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Food insecurity. So uh, so Gary. Um, so you're right, Rob. I mean, I think we have to be really yeah. clear that what happened on October 7 was um, an obscene massacre. And there's no yeah. justification for that. Right. Nobody will ever justify that. Against civilians. Yes, exactly. Even if their primary civilians. targets were Israeli bases, it, it, the civilians were, were included, That's including right. children. Yeah. Yep. yeah, absolutely. It's damnable. So, so when I hear reporting about this in the West, I hear that, what we just said, repeated virtually every night. Right. But what I don't hear is any reference to a massacre which is going on in Gaza. So no one is willing to say, well, okay, but when you drop a bomb, as they did just recently, on a Christian church, which is filled with people who are trying to find refuge, that's astonishing. I mean, why, why don't we call that? So in some of my theological friends, they say, well, Israel just has to aim better. I mean, I, I are you kidding? This is the mo third most sophisticated army in the world. That, that doesn't work. Or when refugees are marching down a major four-lane highway toward the south. Right. The city. Oh, you and saw that. They're just bodies all over the place. It's they, oh, yeah, the videos are unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh Body parts all over because the Israelis have bombed them. So the Israelis you can't say, say that that was a, a military target or a strategic target, that, no. the, that one of the leaders of Hamas was hiding in the church, so we had to bomb the church. This is a street of people trying to I escape know. south. Oh, my God. Yesterday, gosh. there was and a there great there are bodies study. everywhere. There was a great case study of this yesterday. Um, there was an ambulance down south, you know, uh, uh, right. down near um, uh, Rafa City. And so it's an ambulance, speaking of people, and it was from a distance, um, and it had a lot of people inside of it, the ambulance driving, and an Israeli tank just shot the, shot the ambulance and blew it up, and all the people scattered, and just in parts. 
Anyway, and the answer from the Israeli government was it was doing the work of Hamas. Well, they don't they don't know that. They don't know who's in the ambulance. It's impossible to say that. So that every time an right. another obscene massacre takes place in the region in the south or in Gaza anywhere, the answer is, well, it must be connected to Hamas. Right. I had a good friend of mine, uh, Rob. Let me ask, uh, tell me what you think of this analogy, and I don't know what to make of it. I'll toss it your okay. way. All right. Um, this person, a uh, historian, professor, said to me, this reminds me of this story. It would be like a woman who's been married to a man who's been abusing her for decades. Mm. And his abuse of her has gotten worse year after year after year. And one night she gets out of bed, goes over to a table, takes up a gun and shoots him. Oh my. Now he said, these are the questions that now you must ask. Number one, is she guilty of a crime? Right. Yes. Number two, should she be prosecuted? Yes. Right. Um, three, he said, however, in the court hearing, yeah. um, will we allow into court what has transpired in her right. marriage for 35 years? Right. I thought, my goodness. That is a really provocative question because October 7 was a crime. But does the backstory get to be played in our explanation of that right. crime? Right. Yeah. I think the analogy is fitting. I think the thing to understand, though, to maybe put a wrinkle on it, and that is what Hamas did included other people that weren't part of the crime, including civilians and, and, yeah. and others, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but none. But nonetheless, there's still this uh, apropos-ness uh, to it. So let me take us a little bit back here, Gary. I'm going to put in the chat box here um, uh, a, a link to your book, uh, Whose Land, Whose Promise, or the comment box. I hope it goes in. Might go in twice. Uh, when I first went in twice, when I first got started on this issue, um, uh, you know my story a little bit, Gary, and I think everybody else knows my story, and we'll discuss it before, but you know, here I am trained in biblical uh, uh, studies and biblical interpretation, the book of Revelation, eschatology, right. the kingdom of yep. God, and, and all that. But I grew up a Zionist. I grew up a fundamentalist. I grew up a dispensationalist. And I didn't have Lindsay issues. And then I went to the land. And I said, oh, no, this I know what's going on here. And I realized I need to come home and kind of do something about this. And I, was, I first got started my journey. And uh, I was teaching a course on first, uh, first John. And uh, you know my district, my PhD is in in um, in Johannine literature, so uh, I felt. But nonetheless, I picked up your little commentary on the New International Version application commentary, which was <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, right. And I started, yeah. hey, let me see what Gary Birch has to say about this. And I think on like page one, I, I haven't actually. I should have went back and looked at it again. Actually, I think I gave my commentaries away. But um, you had a footnote um, for some reason of whose land, whose promise. Did I really? And I'm like, I need to read that book. <laughs> and sure enough, I did. I'm like, oh, my goodness. It was the first real insight I had into the larger scope of the issue. So, um, you know, what we're trying to do in these uh, live stream events is say, you don't have time to read a book because you got to get engaged now. So let's over the next two weeks, you know, bring in all these voices to kind of educate, educate and equip you. But if you are going to read a book, you know, uh, Elias Shakur, Blood Brothers, is a good place to start. But really for the full background here. Uh, I can't recommend uh, your book. And I know uh, uh, it was updated in, what, 2020? I think yeah, it was. Yeah, about that, around there. Yeah, so so I really encourage you there uh, to do that. And I, and I want to encourage you. you so. Yeah, if you put it up, this is the crazy thing, is that uh, Amazon right now only has it yep. as a, um, what do we call it? Kindle. Yeah, yeah, Kindle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. They're out of the, um, Yeah. but Pilgrim Press, my publisher, the you link is in, the link is in the is in the comment box. Oh, yeah. I can't see it for, here. For Pilgrim okay. Press, that's okay. For, yep. For, okay. And yeah. I mentioned that Amazon's out of stock. And they so have two hundred and sixty-five yeah. copies. <laughs> okay, I put two fifty, so maybe it's down to two fifty by now. Yeah, so, maybe, but yeah, yeah, so but it's going into reprint now as we speak. So yeah, good, and get the Kindle version because you can start reading it uh, in an hour when this episode's finished. Not not sooner than that, but uh, uh, yeah. All right, so. Um, and again, I'm going to have Greg Khalil on to talk a little bit more about this. But if you want to address, and maybe even Jonathan Kutab can answer this as well. But um, we've we've put a little bit of a historical bow on this, so, and I think we want to expand a little bit more with that. But what do you say to the idea that well, Palestinians are are made up people. There's no such thing as Palestine, 
um, and Palestinians don't actually exist. I like the way I frame right. that. Right. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I know that this is a part of Israeli rhetoric all the time that there is, a, for a long time, Benjamin Netanyahu wouldn't even say the word Palestine. Interesting. Um, okay, so what 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 is this? Well, first of all, Palestine itself is a region. It is a geographical location that spans from the area sort of north of the Sea of Galilee, from Galilee, up around the bottom of Lebanon, um, okay. all the way down to Egypt, to the co near Egypt, but not going into Sinai. And then it goes over to the Jordan River. Um, but it used to be considered across the Jordan River as well. Um, so it is a geographical region, and the native population that lived in that geographical region um, have always been called Palestinians for a very long time. I mean, we're talking about centuries and centuries and centuries, that kind of long time. Just like up in Lebanon, the Lebanese belong to that geographical area. I can do the same with Egypt. So therefore, um, the Palestinian region, this province, we could call it Palestine, for 400 years was under Turkish control. So it the never Ottomans, yeah. had an opportunity to form what we could call a national identity. Um, but those opportunities for national identities really were only being born in about 1918 to 1925, um, and especially in the 1940s, um, after uh, the French and the British began letting go of these areas that they controlled. So this population has not moved. It has stayed here. I mean, the British counted them. They've always been there. But they, because of the call under the British with Jewish Zionists to build a Zionist state inside of that land, they really never had their act together to raise their own flag and sound their own national anthem and say, look, what about us? Where's our place for this? And in many cases, the fault lies with the Palestinians in their disorganization, but they were up against Israeli Jews who were coming out of Europe and were very skilled at doing this kind of thing. And so therefore, when someone <laughs> says to me, well, it's a made up thing. Well, no, it's, um, it isn't. I mean, this is the same population the Brits counted. They've never moved. They've always been there. And um, uh, some people say, well, maybe they migrated from Arabia or something like that. No, that's not the case. They have their own dialect. They sound different than the Syrians, especially than the Lebanese. Um, they have their own. They have their own clothing. Even they, they, they very much have. And ten percent of them are Christian. That's one of the unique things about them. Ten percent of them are Christian. However, the Christians have had so many networks in the West. They've scattered because the oppression in Israel has been so bad. So now we're down to 2% inside of the country, perhaps. Um, that's it. So yeah, so the Palestinians are a continuously living culture that, um, that, that has lived inside of the very region that, um, that Israel was built on. You know, one of the crazy things to me, uh, Rob, is that in 1947, when the Israelis, did, I mean, the British did their last census of the of the country, um, you know, God bless the British. They are such good occupiers. Can you imagine this? This little island called Britain occupied India. Yeah, They've yeah. Got to be good to do that. <laughs> so these I'm areas. Depending on how you find good, but I know what you mean. Well, you've got to be yeah. well organized. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So the guy that worked in in India, um, uh, he actually also helped in Palestine. Anyway, wow. they divided the whole country into counties. Unbelievable. I mean, Arab counties, really? That is so European, so British. Anyway, then they did a census in every county in the whole country. Now, this is 1947. And when they did the census, there was only one county in the entire landscape that had a majority Jewish population. It was right around Tel Aviv. And even there, it was right. only 60, 65 percent majority. That's remarkable. How so? The notion of building Israel on top of that demographic reality mm. is why there is this struggle because it this is not a land without a people for a people without a land. That was a kind the of common narrative, yeah, common narrative, a jingoistic thing that was said throughout the early twentieth century. Nobody's living here. Jews coming out of Europe. We don't have anywhere to go. Well, that was all wrong because there were people living there and the British have proved it. Right, right. 
Right. Uh, Gary, we have a question that came in, and if, if you don't want to address it fully, I, again, I'll have Greg Khalil on. I think he'll be, he'll be happy to address it as well. But the question is, what was the thinking or strategy of Hamas's attack? Uh, you alerted, you alluded to, uh, Dr. Burge alluded to the fact that they attacked sites that were di uh, dispossessed or disposed. That was Ilan Pape. Yeah, he said okay, that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So what is what was their end game? Let's put it that way. What is their end game? Um, I can give you what is the common Israeli. There are two Israeli versions. One is extreme and catastrophic, and the other is very political. The uh, catastrophic one is this is anti-Judaism. They simply want to kill us. The other one is that um, uh, Israel has uh, created uh, renewed relationships with the Gulf states, the Arab states, right. and in particular Saudi Arabia. And therefore, there have been economic ties built between Israel and the um, Arab nations uh, over by the Gulf. So therefore, Hamas is trying to um, basically break that up because the Palestinian cause had gone to the back burner. Right. And so the Israeli narrative so is they were trying to disrupt this, this thing right here. Um, uh, uh, Gary, again, if I can interrupt you quickly, you're talking about the Abrahamic Accords. Yes, that's right, exactly. And, and part of the understanding of the Palestinians, if I can inter interject, was that the Arab, other Arab nations around and other Islamic nations around would not come, uh, uh, establish ties with Israel until the Palestinian cause had been exactly settled. Exactly right. Yeah, and exactly. Because they are beginning to make uh, ties with other nations. The Palestinians are like, hey, wait a minute. It looks like we're, we're a lost cause. Yeah, now. we don't. Where's our where's our piece of this pie? Yeah, right. we, we never. This situation has not been solved. So therefore, um, Hamas has placed Saudi Arabia in a dilemma. Therefore, um, Saudi Arabia is is it going to support Israel in all of this, or are they going to speak on behalf of the Gazans? And if they speak on the behalf of the Gazans, what happens to the Abraham Accords? That is a standard Israeli presentation. You'll hear it on the American news uh, regularly. Thomas Friedman, New York Times, this is his line on this whole thing. But on the other hand, there are other people who are saying, well, not so fast. Um, for the last six years, we have been hearing throughout the West Bank and around Gaza that another uprising is coming. Um, mm -hmm. And this should never have surprised the Israelis. Um, there have been two uprisings, one in 1987, one in 2000. We call it the, the intifadas. That means to shake off the Israelis. So anyway, um, and the rumor has been, when is this going to break out? Now, mm -hmm. why would it break? Where is it going to break out? We wondered, is it going to be in the West Bank? What is going to be the catalyst for this whole thing? So, um, uh, there are many Palestinians who said, we knew this was going to happen a, a long time ago. In fact, there are rumors that this was more widely known than everyone realized. So um, why is it? So what is it, their anger? Well, two things. Uh, the first is um, Israel, up until October 7, had as many as five um, 5,000 Palestinians incarcerated without trial in the occupied mm -hmm. territories. And since October 7, it has gone up to 10,000 who are incarcerated without trial, with a couple thousand that have come right out of Gaza. So anyway, they view that as a kind of kidnapping. They, in other words, just taking someone off the street and placing them in prison. And some of them have been there in detention, never knowing what they're charged with for decades. Right. It's very common that they don't get charged with a crime. Very, very common. So therefore, Hamas is reacting to that because that has been accelerating. But the other thing they they say is... Gary, let me interject really quickly if I can. One of the issues that, Gama, that Hamas said on day two was, we're ready to negotiate peace. We just want an exchange of prisoners. That's right. They wanted some yeah. of these people to get out of incarceration. Yeah. And the Israelis have said, well, we think they're dangerous. Well, you know, like in our courts, you've got to prove this. But Palestinians don't have access to a judicial system inside of right. Israel. Most of my friends don't know that either. All they have access to is a military tribunal. And you can imagine how- You mean inside the Palestinian territory? Inside of the Palestinian territories. Yeah, okay, yeah. Not inside of Israel proper, but inside of the right. West Bank and Gaza. Yeah, right. So they just go before a military tribunal. Okay. Anyway, right. so there's this. But, but the other thing my friends are telling me, the catalyst for this is- Gaza didn't simply attack, Gaza exploded. Right. So you have what they call an open air prison with all of this poverty, all of this unemployment, 
hopelessness, as one fellow said to me, when you're already dead, you're not afraid of dying. Mm. And so therefore, you might say Gaza just exploded in fury right, right. because of the last 16 years of, of brutal um, um, occupation and uh, um, um, what's the word I want, Rob? Oh, oppression. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, uh, oh, 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 and, and bar, uh, um, embargo. And sur- embargoing, embargo. Yeah, so yeah. in other words, you can't move goods in and out. I mean, the thing has been completely right. shut down. Yeah, blockade. That's the word I wanted. Yeah, yeah, blockade, that's the word I was trying to think of. Yeah, so, yeah. I couldn't get the word. Anyway, so that's probably this. That's the common explanation, at least locally, uh, among the Palestinians. And when it exploded, um, all kinds of people in Gaza were really afraid. They thought, right. "Oh my gosh, this is going to go end terribly." Right. In the census last year, um, easily fifty percent of uh, Gazans are unsympathetic to Gaza. So, the Hamas. So anyway, it's. Um, it will take us quite a while to figure out exactly how this happened, why this happened, and and above all, why the Israelis didn't know it was going to happen. Okay. Another question came in also, and again, I think Greg might have insights. I'm not sure how familiar you are yeah. with this, uh, if you have a thought, but it says, uh, over the years, the United Nations um, has, this is what this person says, I've read this, that Hamas would hijack the aid that Israel and other countries would send. I don't think Israel sent aid, but no, no, that Israel and other countries would send. Um, and uh, why would Hamas keep the Palestinians in poverty? Um, let Greg handle that one. Um, okay. I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> um, okay. But remember, I would go back to saying it's almost as if you're imagining Hamas is this is this gang that's inside of Gaza. Um, on the other hand, remember that Ga- Hamas is responsible for the functioning of all of Gaza. I think after they won the election and woke up the next day, this resistance organization said, oh my gosh, we have to, we're responsible for garbage pickup. Are you kidding me? So suddenly they had to become government. And um, so I'm, things like that, we have to be really careful because there is so much misinformation that is floating around right now. Um, I I think that information is largely incorrect. Um, But uh, uh, so Angela, who asked the question, please feel free to email that to me. I'll make sure that sure. Greg addresses it on Wednesday night, or if you're able to uh, join us, uh, Angela, on Wednesday night, yeah. uh, we'll have Greg do that. Let me give a quick commercial interruption here. Um, uh, Determined Truth is a 501c3 a nonprofit whose mission is to challenge the church to be the church. And at a time like this, I'm so convicted that the church is not acting like the church. Um, and so uh, my associate, Danny Hall, and I, we meet with over 100 pastors in India uh, via Zoom each week, teaching and training and equipping them. Many of them are very poor pastors with little to no education. They take what we give them and they go preach it on Sundays and they teach it because they have nothing else uh, there. I also host the weekly Determined Truth podcast, which focuses on understanding the scriptures and what it means for us today. And I think Gary, by the way, Gary, you might be the most um, uh, prolific um, uh, guest appearance, appear on, on the Determined Truth podcast. Uh, there's a couple others. Michael Gorman's been on several times also, but uh, Gary's been there as well. I also write a weekly blog for Pathios. You can find all this on the germantruth.com homepage and links links for that. And then we have a regular Bible study on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. Pacific time. If you want to be part of it, it's on Zoom. Uh, the recordings are then posted on the, the Determined Truth YouTube page. We're doing the Book of Acts uh, through the New Testament right, right now. We just finished a study of the Book of Revelation. If you want that, it's on the Rob Dalrymple at YouTube page. I'll move it over uh, as soon as I can find the time uh, there as well. So, uh, Gary, let's... Uh, talk theology a little bit, if we can, the last few minutes, and we know yeah, that this wait, is Rob, before you go there, I just want to yeah, tell please. you, Rob, yeah. you know, we really do look up to Rob. He's really downplaying his influence in all of this. I mean, he has this marvelous ministry and podcast, um, and he is really a, a fabulous activist organizer of really important issues. And so um, I happen to be in a small group that we discuss all of these issues on a regular basis, and it's very impressive to see how he is able to keep, uh, to herd all these cats. Um, but um, he has is probably one of the best uh, prepared people on this topic uh, of anybody that I know. So you're Thank really you. fortunate. If you're a regular listener to the broadcast, this is a really a great place to be. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. And your friendship has been really special to me as well. So, um, all right, let's talk theology, Gary. Uh, we know uh, that one of the common escapes is, uh, well, God gave them this land. Uh, and you wrote about extensively a response to this. So kind of 
give us a, a quick insights. We got 15 minutes left if we are faithful to our time schedule, but kind of give us some, some insights. How do you respond to that idea? My goodness, Rob, I need at least an hour and a half. <laughs> well, we okay. both wrote books. We both wrote full, full books on this, but uh, so let me give we'll, you a we'll short cool sort of pitch. So I do have a book called Jesus and the Land. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me, a, I have a. I'll put. A, I'll put that up on the screen. Okay. Go ahead. So anyway, um, so I've spent a lot of time on this because it's an important subject. Um, it comes up regularly, and so therefore, I think you and I have to address it. Um, there are three times in the Book of Genesis where. Um, the uh, the book of Genesis promises to Abraham uh, that he and his descendants are going to have the land of Canaan. It's very clear. And so therefore, land is tied to covenant. Now, um, it's also clear in the book of Leviticus that Israel never owns the land. Let's be right. clear about that. Um, right, Leviticus right. says that Yahweh, God, owns the land and that Israel is a tenant, is a renter. Okay, so they have, right. um, they have uh, permanent access to the property, but the owner is in heaven. <laughs> so we're clear about that because the owner actually has got expectations because the land is tied to the covenant. And therefore, if you're faithful to the covenant, then you can stay in the land. If you're unfaithful to the covenant, then you can't stay in the land. And so therefore, the exile to Babylon is explained as faithlessness. And the prophets are clear about this again and again yes. and again. The book of Judges, that's one of its main themes. Um, in fact, two tribes at the end of the book lose their property, their land, because they are not faithful to the covenant. All right. Because uh, uh, Judges says, because everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Oh, they did. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, um, the Old Testament says, okay, so fidelity to the covenant, faithfulness to God, righteousness, is an essential component of receiving the gift of the land. Absolutely clear. Okay. So my friends who are reading the Old Testament and reading those promises in Genesis, um, they want to apply that to the modern state of Israel. And that's problematic because in the modern state of Israel, you're looking at an intentionally secular country right. that at the very beginning was established by by people from Europe, like Ben-Gurion, who had no interest in any kind of religious life. Over 75% of the people in Israel are what they call non-religious. Synagogue, temple, they, they don't do any of that kind of thing. It's highly secular. Okay, so here's my only question. If we parachuted Jeremiah into Tel Aviv tomorrow, <laughs> and he looked around and we said, okay, so Jeremiah, what about the land promises? His first question would be, are these people faithful to the covenant? Do they share the faith of Abraham? And are they living righteous lives just like the prophets have all said? And inevitably, your answer is going to have to be, well, I'm sorry, um, over half of them don't even believe in you. Right. So what? Is, how does that equation work? You're, you're going to have to say a secular state is making religious claims on an Old Testament promise, and that Old Testament promise requires a religious life. Okay, got that. So you're uh, one second, let me, okay, before you go to the next point, one of the common replies by a Christian Zionist, and again, a Christian Zionist is a Christian who believes that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish right. people because of God's covenant promises in Genesis 12. One of the common responses, of course, is the fact that the promises that God was going to restore them to the land are tied to repentance. But there are some verses that say, God will bring them back to the land and they'll repent. And they go, oh, see, it happens in that order. God brings them back to the land and then they repent. Um, uh, how do you respond to that? Because there's other verse like Deuteronomy 6, of course, when you're in exile and then remember, and then you repent, then yeah. I'll restore you like Deuteronomy 30 yeah. verses 1 through 6. How, how do you respond yeah. to that idea? My struggle there is I ask, okay, like with every text in the Bible, what you want to ask is, what is its original context? What was its original audience? You always have to ask that. Okay, and so yes. therefore, what you have are those texts are coming out of promises reassuring Israel after the Babylonian exile. And so what folks have done is they've taken that formula and they have moved it 2,500 years right, right. and applied it to the present circumstances. Right. So it, it's the same as I heard just yesterday. It was, you know, Israel had this war with Amalek, the Amalekites. Yeah. Somebody yeah. said, 
literally, I, this is in print. It's so crazy that the Gazans are Amalekites. And yep. therefore, this is the fulfillment of uh, the, the Amalekite con war, conquest. Another lady came up to me just recently when I was speaking, and she showed me Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4, that says, Gaza will be raised. And I said, she said, see, it's a prophecy, and it's now being fulfilled. And I was like, well, wait a minute. How many times in 4,000 years do you think Raza has been, Gaza has been raised? And what was Zephaniah talking about? Back right, 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 right. It's crazy. Okay. So Gaza Ron, was a city then, too, by the way, and now it's a region. Yeah, so It's actually exactly yeah. right. All right. Yeah. So that's the Jewish political theological okay. problem. Okay. And okay. let's just put that on the shelf for a minute. Okay. But I'm not Jewish. I'm Christian. And therefore, everything that I say about the covenants in the Old Testament, I have got to view through the lens right. of the covenant of Christ. Right. And what I actually find inside of the New Testament, and here is the short version of that book, is that the New Testament does two dramatic things. The first is it redefines who are the heirs of Abraham. That is shocking. And Paul is willing to bring Gentiles into that sonship with Abraham. That mixes up all the cards, and the old game can't be played anymore. The second thing that um, the New Testament does is it changes Judaism's notion of spiritual geography. In other words, um, is it about holy land, holy Jerusalem, holy temple? Is that the geographical space? When I take people to the holy land and they say, oh, I, I want to get rebaptized in that water, or I want to take home some of that sand, because that sand is holier than other sand, because my backyard dirt in Iowa really isn't as great. God blesses that sand, but not my backyard. So the New Testament is saying, no, 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 hold on a minute. What you have is a dislocation of that because we find in Christ what was promised in the land. One illustration, John 15, um, yeah. the old image in the, in the Old Testament is Israel is like vines that were carried by God across the desert and brought into the promised land and planted there God built a vineyard, put a wall up, cultivated the vineyard, and blessed it. Yes. That's Isaiah, Isaiah 5. Is that what you're referring to? Isaiah oh, 5. Sorry. Exactly right. All right, there you go. Okay. So in John, John 15, Jesus says, the question, ladies and gentlemen, is not, are you a vine planted in God's vineyard? Are you a branch which has been grafted into me? So that in the story, mm -hmm. the vineyard only has one vine. And it's Christ. So therefore, right. being rooted in God's blessing has to come through Christ. So now what we have is this notion that somehow what I seek in the Holy Land, I find in Jesus. Right. Just like what I seek in the temple, I find exactly. in Jesus. So you have a fulfillment in Jesus, both for the temple and the land. But I can't probably go into it more because... We're going to run out of time, but you get the idea. Awesome. Two major yeah, shifts yeah. if you're a Christian. So I would urge all my Christian friends, think Christianly about this. Right. Don't do Jewish theology because you are a disciple of Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we're doing is we're taking the Old Testament promises, skipping over the New Testament exactly. and landing in 1948 yep. without going, wait a minute, the promises are understood. Matthew's grappling with those promises too. So is Mark, exactly. Luke, John, Acts, Paul. Yep. Everybody. How are they grappling with these promises and how do we read it through their lens? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that becomes so significant. And of course, you know, to, to, this, uh, whole, Jesus. this whole notion of dislocation is actually what led to the death of Stephen in the book yes. of Acts. Because yeah. he's saying, look, you know, you want to protect the Holy Land here. This is in the first century, everyone was talking about the restoration of, of the kingdom of David, restoration of this. And Stephen says, well, no, God spoke to, you know, Abraham over in Iraq and Babylonia, Moses in Egypt. God can speak everywhere. All right, all right. So you, this is really, when you begin to challenge the religiously strengthened uh, worldview that someone has, mm. and it's buttressed by their politics, right? they really can be mad really be yep. angry with you and that's 
the result is is Stephen. Yeah. So, Gary, tell me what you think of this, because and I know you, you're familiar with my book here. That is one of the avenues that I take in that conversation is what made the land holy is that it was the place where God was going to dwell among his people. That's right. Uh, it, it's the temple that ultimately makes it holy. So when you look at the New Testament, which clearly there's just no, no debate that Jesus is the temple. Right. And then Paul extrapolates that to say, we are the temple of God. Exactly. And the fact that we're then expanded from Jerusalem to the Samaritan to the ends of the earth, the land that the entire earth then clearly becomes the holy place because that's where God's people dwell and that's where God dwells. And Paul makes that explicit in Romans yes. 4. So in Romans exactly. chapter 4, when Paul is yep. making his case that the children of Abraham now include all Jews and Gentiles who share the faith of Abraham, that's enormous. And then Paul pulls out the zinger. It's yeah. in Romans 4.13 where yeah, Paul yeah, says yeah. that God was promising to Abraham that he would inherit the, the answer should be Cana. But instead, it says, the world. So God's project in Christ is not the restoration yeah. of a kingdom in the Middle East, a political nation. God's project in the New Testament is the restoration of all his creation. Right, right, That's right. why all ethnicities, every race, every person, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, to me, that is an exciting message of the gospel. Right. That's the good news. Yeah. That's the good news. Yeah. Yeah. That's the good news. Yeah. I was going to add, you know, Jesus begins this redefinition of God's people by saying, my mother, my father, and my sister, or my mother, my brother, and my sister are those who do the will of my father who is in heaven, right. which is radical because that's not how you define it when it's right. lineage is based on ancestry. Yeah. Uh, and now it's based on faithfulness to the father. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, I'm very good. All right. So we have one more question, and you know what's coming. Uh, and that is, well, Gary, is this replacement theology? Ah, uh, yes. Um, we we have to admit that at some level, well, let's put it this way. Um, supersessionism is the technical term, I think, that you're getting at. Yep. Um, and uh, replacement theology is a kind of a uh, a poor younger sibling. Um, okay. So let's just go for the whole enchilada here. <laughs> Supersessionism means uh, one thing supersedes another. One thing comes along and takes over for another thing and makes the other thing obsolete. That certainly is the view of Islam. Islam believes that it supersedes Christianity and Christianity is obsolete. Okay? All right. But what happened in the early medieval period and especially throughout medieval Europe um, supersessionism said that the Gentile church now has taken over for Jewish Israel, and mm -hmm. therefore Judaism is obsolete, hence can be subject to persecution, and that culminates, of course, in the Holocaust. Okay, mm -hmm. we understand all that. But when I'm reading my New Testament, supersessionism is an anachronism, um, because this is not a conversation in the New Testament about a Gentile church taking over Judaism. The, the New Testament, you might say, is an argument among Jews. One group is claiming Jesus is the Messiah, and another group is saying he is not. Now, the claim that Jesus is the Messiah is saying when new wine is placed in old wineskins, the old wineskins are affected. And so therefore, what you have in the New Testament is certainly some degree of replacement. Yes, there's no doubt. Scholars who work with this all the time say, behind, they whisper it. They say, we can't deny this. There is a degree of replacement. Jesus and the temple, that's replacement language. It is. Some people are more happy with saying it's fulfillment language. That's okay, but really we're, we're moving words around here. One thing has come, and it's affected the other. A new covenant with Christ has affected the other. So to live inside of the world of the New Testament is these, these Jews are saying that, that, you know, without Christ, you are in jeopardy with God. And that's why Jews for Jesus do evangelism among Jews. Why Paul in Romans 9 is so upset for his own kinsmen. There is a direct parallel for this right in the first century. And that is down at the Dead Sea. There's the Qumran community. Yeah, and if yeah. you read their scriptures, their writings, they say the very same thing about all of Judaism up on the mountain in Jerusalem. 
Right. They are doing replacement. So, yeah, the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Church, well, you're talking about a little bit of replacement there. But, yes, we have to acknowledge that there is something like this going on inside of the New Testament. Um, and most New Testament scholars, I would say most, um, agree. There is something like this at work. Uh, and I would nuance it. I'm one of those exceptions, right? And we've talked about, right? Because, well, for like one, obviously, the word, the, the like word replacement is so pejorative, right? It's just used so negatively, like, oh, if you're a replacement, there, therefore, it must be wrong. It's like, well, let's let's grapple with this. Um, but right. but what I look at that and see this, uh, if it's replacement theology, then Isaiah is, is replacing. Because what Isaiah is saying is, you guys have gone over here, and the true path is in faithfulness to the covenant, and you've right. left the covenant. And and I and so I, I and Jesus saying I'm the vine, or if you believe Moses, you re, you believe me. Uh, I, I see this as the continuation of the story, uh, and Jesus' word of uh, the language of N.T. Right, it, the kingdom is ex expanded. Is is oh, yeah. expanded? That's right, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. But those who are not a part of the expansion, yeah, are in jeopardy. Well, they're cut off as Romans. Yeah, they're, they're, they're cut off. So yeah, you yeah. got see yeah. that's where the repulsive language comes in. So N.T. Right, Wright yeah. is absolutely correct. It is theologically, it's the question of how much continuity do we have between the New Testament and the Old? Lots. Right. But is there any discontinuity? Right. That's yeah. the replacement or fulfillment or supersessionist question. Do we have right. discontinuity? So Jesus can say, You have heard Moses say, but I say unto you, Oh, okay. There's continuity with Moses, but there's discontinuity too. Jesus mm -hmm. is taking what Moses is teaching and now um, turning it ever so dra dramatically. Yeah, yeah. And his disciples should follow his teaching, not those of Moses. All right. Well, I think in two weeks from today, in one hour, we will continue this particular conversation. Sure, I hope so. <laughs> It'll go yeah. on for the next few centuries. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm referring to our, our event in San Antonio in two weeks. Oh, um, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is actually in two weeks and in one hour. So. Uh, Gary, thank you so much for being yeah. with us. Um, Rob, thanks for all the work we, you do. We didn't get to all the questions. I'm going to put in the in the comment box here how you can continue to follow some of the work that Gary does at Bethlehem Bible College and Christ at the Checkpoint. I encourage you to, to look at that link uh, and find out more and uh, read his books uh, and, follow, and follow the work that Gary does. And we want to thank you for joining us today. You bet, Rob. And anything I'm doing, you can find me, at, as everybody does nowadays, uh, GaryBurge.org website. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. Yeah, uh, GaryBurge.org. So all the books are there. Um, yeah, okay. all I'll good. Put that in the chat box also, so you can cut and paste that. Um, yep. Very good. So, Rob, right. we look Thank you, everyone. We admire you. Thanks for all your work. Thank you very much. I appreciate you very much as well. And uh, uh, take care. All right. All right. So, bye.